Hey everyone, welcome to our focus week on vaccines. There is so much that we could cover regarding vaccines. I've got some great guests this week, and today I have Dr. Nick Thompson, holistic veterinarian from England. Uh, great guy, very smart guy, uh, and he, we if we get him started, we may be here for a few hours, but... <laughs> We'll try to keep this semi-reasonable length. Um, and for those of you who have been hiding under a rock somewhere and haven't heard about our International Naturally Healthy Pets Experience that will be held in Orlando, Florida, mm. October 12th and 13th this year, Dr. Nick Thompson is one of our featured speakers coming in from around the world. We are so excited. We'll finally get to meet in person. So mm -hmm, that will mm -hmm. be amazing. So Dr. Nick, thank you for agreeing to be my guest today. Dr. Judy, it's so lovely to see you again. Uh, how long is it since our last chat? Maybe four months or so? Yeah, it's been a little while. It's probably been it's, a few months. So It's great. Um, <laughs> A very happy new year to you and the gang. Um, and um, I wish you all very well for 2024. Thank you. We are, we're excited. This year we are really kind of putting all of our focus into that one pot of that mm -hmm. international mm -hmm. experience because it is going to be so amazing. And we're so excited that we got all of you from around the world to, uh, to agree to come over. So we're going to have a really, really good time. So anybody who hasn't gotten their tickets, and the amazing thing is uh, the VIP tickets are getting close to sold out and we're still 10 months away so excellent pretty amazing excellent yeah, pe people are really excited about meeting this this group of experts that we have coming in so i think it's gonna be really fun anyway so this week we're talking about vaccines and um today we're going to focus on a couple of different things um <laughs> it's funny uh we got a couple wires crossed and dr nick um somehow got the impression that we wanted him to discuss the canine respiratory infection that is kind of a mystery thing going around in the U.S. And his first response was, what do I know about what's going on in the U.S.? <laughs> well, but, I know a lot more now. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but the thing is, when you put a scientific mind behind looking at something, um, no matter what it is, you can dig deep and get a lot of information that is very helpful for all of those watching and listening. And uh, the other thing that we want to touch on today is vaccine shedding, because um, I don't think that pet owners have any idea what happens. And I do have an interview this week with Dr. Gene Dodds, where we're talking about how vaccines work and so what it takes for them to take effect. But we didn't talk about vaccine shedding. And I don't think that most people understand what that is. So you want to hit a couple highlights on that, Nick? Vaccine shedding. It's, uh, it is a phenomenon whereby when you vaccinate a dog, we'll, just, we'll confine this mainly to dogs, but we're going to use some human examples as well. And kitty cats are basically in the same thing. We just, cats we cats will, be, will, be, will, be, will be similar as well. I don't do a lot of cats these days. I am so run off my feet with dogs and raw food. You'd be pleased to hear that I've, uh, 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 I'm not able to always see my uh, uh, any feline patients. But uh, it's the same. It's pretty much a similar thing. So what happens bizarrely, let's talk about parvovirus, for example. With parvovirus, okay, you go to your veterinarian and he, she will give the vaccine in the scruff, okay, here. And yet it is a well-researched um, phenomenon that actually that puppy, say, doesn't have to be a puppy, can be uh, an adult as well, will, in some cases, not every dog will do it, that virus will actually leave that dog that will come out in the poop and will contaminate the any area that that that, that poop contacts parvovirus is a is a really 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 persistent omnipresent virus okay so with um so that shedding i was just about to launch into into parvovirus because it's fascinating uh it's a really fascinating virus do you want to go there dr judy sure 
Okay. Sure, we'll start with that. I, yeah. It's, okay, so parvovirus causes a, a disease in, in, in dogs, usually puppies, and the symptom is a bit like cholera, where just fluid pours out the back end of the dog. And uh, over here, we say you can smell parvo just 100 yards off because... <laughs> Yeah, this this basically this like raspberry jam, really thin raspberry jam comes out the back of the dog. They get very dehydrated very rapidly. It has up to about 50 percent fatality rate. So you've got to get your skates on when you're treating it. Yeah, it's 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 not a subtle disease, but it's uh, and it's and it's that's how it's trans transmitted. Yeah, because these dogs will just spray this stuff everywhere. So if you've got one dog in the house who either has natural infection or has just been vaccinated, and they they can shed for weeks and weeks afterwards, but that environment will be utterly contaminated, and therefore there is a there's a likelihood that that part that that the, the the disease is going to spread from dog to dog to dog to dog. And this is what we see in the rescue situation. And so Ron Schultz, he's, he's done quite a lot of work and he's shown that when, with the, with the vaccine, if you've got it in a, in a, in a rescue scenario, if you vaccinate all the dogs in the, uh, in the rescue in order to protect them from direct contact with the, uh, infected individual, the sick dog, it can it can begin to um, have a protective effect within forty eight hours. This is this is his work. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Ron Schultz is, is is amazing. He's the the grandfather of vaccinology, just as Dr. Jean Dodds is the grandmother. I hope she wouldn't mind me calling her that of uh, of vaccinology <laughs> and thyroid and thyroid disease. Um, but parvo, parvo, really, really fascinating disease. So um, it, when they are developing these, these vaccines, and they have been for 30, 40 years, and what happens is in order to create dogs, puppies, who, are, who have never had any exposure to environmental parvo, because it's everywhere, okay, I'm just going to say that, Parvo is everywhere. It's on your shoes when you go to the dentist. It's in the dentist, even if they've never had a dog there, because it's just ubiquitous. Yeah, it's 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 you know probably even in surgical suites, which are cleaned out, you know, five times a day or something like. You probably, if you worked hard, you would. I'm talking human surgical suites. You'd probably find contamination there. So it's ultra contaminating at a very low level which is why all our dogs don't die of parvo immediately okay so it's everywhere but it's at a low level which has a good consequence i'll tell you about that if you like in a second so it's absolutely everywhere and in order to make to, to have these puppies who never ever 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 see parvo so that they can test antibody responses and things like that they have to they have to suit up in order to go into the kennel they have to have positive pressure ventilation that means that all the air it blows into the room and then out of the room so that there's no draft from the environment, which will have this low level of parvo contamination. Yeah, they have to make sure all the, air, all, the, all, the, all the air goes out. It is that contaminatory, which is, which is fascinating. You know, the last three years, we've learned an awful lot about respiratory viruses and, 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 and uh, um, their, their contagion and, and what have you. But there you go. That's just a little bit of background on parvovirus. So coming back to the shedding, which is a fascinating topic, it's you put it in the scruff, yeah, as a veterinarian, you put it in the scruff and then within, within days, it can then be shed into the environment. So if you've got a, an older dog who's just been vaccinated and you've got a young puppy who's not yet been vaccinated, I'm not going to make any judgments on whether vaccination is a good or a bad thing. I'm not anti-vax. In fact, I love the principle of vaccination. I have to say that's a, that's a big topic. We can go there if you like. Um, <laughs> OK, so it means that, yeah, you, you take Fido, five year old Fido to the vets. You get a you get a jab and Myrtle, the cocker spaniel at home, who's only like seven weeks old. She's going to get possibly exposed to parvovirus probably at a higher level than the general contamination level potentially from fido who comes home 
and has just been vaccinated. That's a very long way round of saying. So I have a question with mm, that. Yeah. Because the vaccine is a modified live virus. Yeah. For parvo. Okay. Uh, we use killed vaccine for rabies and yeah. everything else is pretty much a modified live. Do you want to explain that um, for people who are not, not, not sure about the modified live? Just just give us well, a little rundown. Well, and so down. this is my, my, my question oh, to okay. you. Because a modified live is basically they've taken the virus and they've tweaked it. So that the body will recognize it yeah. as parvovirus or whatever it is that we're vaccinating mm -hmm, for. Mm -hmm. But we're not giving the actual whole virus yeah. that would make them sick. So when they're shedding, mm -hmm. so this is my question to you, when they're shedding because they were given a modified live virus, yeah. are they shedding the modified live virus and therefore it would not be infectious or are they shedding actual parvovirus and therefore it is infectious you know what i cannot answer that with certainty <laughs> i think though just going from, from so basic you open a can of worms now yeah no let's do it let's <laughs> absolutely go there so what happens if they're trying to, to uh modify viruses in the laboratory, one of the methods is called passage. And what you do is, unfortunately, you get a big long line of, of rabbits. God bless them, they suffer for humanity. And and you you take the infection, say parvo, yeah, which is which is uh, you know really nasty, you inject it into one rabbit, you let it it, it um sit and, and incubate for a day or two you then take sample from that first rabbit and put it into the second rabbit you then take it after a few days into the third and the fourth and the fifth and the fifth this is called passage yeah because of probably because of pasteur yeah french yeah. All, all, all things french so and what happens is you can get changes because viruses can under certain circumstances uh change within the body so if we're if we're using the the principle principle of passage then if you put a modified live that is a something that looks like looks like parvo smells like parvo acts like parvo but is not very good at infecting you and causing you to come down with this cholera like disease okay i think it would probably be possible for that to flip into active what 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 are your thoughts yeah because you've been you've been dealing with parvo for many years you've been thinking <laughs> about parvo for many years um where where would well, you it, be you on know that? this it really it is an interesting disease and uh -huh. when i was in veterinary school uh -huh. from 1980 to 1984 was uh -huh. when parvo really kind of splashed into the news yeah. and our icu ward at the vet school was cram packed i mean mm. Mm. hundreds of yeah, yeah, yeah. sick puppies and dogs with parvo and that was before we had the vaccine so they started using the cat parvovirus That's vaccine right. basically yeah. um to start vaccinating the dogs while they were developing the canine vaccine so yeah. this is one of those times when you say okay vaccination like i'm not an anti-vaxxer either i'm but i want responsible vaccination I so agree. having gone through that during that time period and having so many sick dogs and then when i got out of school i practiced emergency medicine for quite a few years and then i opened a clinic in a very low income area and so we had parvo coming out our ears particularly mm -hmm. rottweilers and pit bulls and dobermans uh, labradors they seem to be the breeds that were particularly the rottweilers they were hit yeah. very very hard yeah. um and, i mean we had a couple of rottweiler backyard breeders like they shouldn't have even had one dog let alone 20 um and i mean they would just bring in litter after litter after litter of these dogs with parvo and you know finally after many years of being in those areas and being able to educate people and getting the adults mm -hmm. vaccinated so that the puppies would have a better chance mm -hmm. of being born with some immunity um you know, we started to really see the changes and we started to really see a decrease in the number of dogs. So I would say in my last 15 years of practice, I rarely saw it. Mm -hmm. And that was because we, we had educated people and we were doing a better job. Um, so, and as far as the, the shedding, I never really thought about it. Um, 
so for instance, the an intranasal vaccine, like the kennel cough vaccine, mm -hmm. which is a, a bacterial vaccine, we've we've always known that that one sheds. You know, you put it in the nose and then they sneeze it back out, mm -hmm. and they're <laughs> yeah. it's it's uh, pretty obvious. Parvo, I never really thought about being a shedding mm -hmm. vaccine. Yeah. So that's a that's an interesting. <clears throat> so so in your experience, mm -hmm. have you seen? cases where dogs came in and were vaccinated and then went home and a puppy that was not vaccinated then became ill? Uh, definitely seen uh, vaccinated puppies getting parvo. That is a thing. That is a definite thing. Because what happens, you know, in the early days, they had parvo one, didn't they? The parvo, but the, the, the parvo one vaccine and then then they came in with Parvo 2 when? Late 90s, maybe? Parvo 2? But even, mm, even well, maybe that's a European thing. Um, but even with Parvo 2, probably super duper, maybe slightly different antigen, um, it uh, you still saw breakthrough. Yeah, you, 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 mm. you, you're fully vaccinated. But then, um, Dr. Judy, if you look at the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, you read through, it's a very readable document. It's like 37 pages long, half of it's dogs, half of it's cats, but very readable. They say that with the standard puppy vaccination regime, yeah, so that would either be um, eight weeks and 12 weeks or 10 weeks and 12 weeks and 14 weeks or something like that. Yeah. The baby shots, yeah. The puppy, puppy shots, the kitten shots every, every two to three weeks uh, apart. They say that if you do that to a large population, 2% of those puppies, let's talk about puppies, 2% will not take the vaccine. Okay which is why they then come along and say the booster at about 15 months of age. Yeah, this is the first booster shot that the puppy gets right. when they're growing up and the juveniles and jumping around the place. That's why they have that extra shot. However, it does. There is a phenomenon where you give them a shot of Parvo and then you teeter test. We can talk about teeter testing. You teeter test and you, you you take a blood sample. You look at the antibody response to that, and they have no response whatsoever. So, uh, right. what are the statistics for that? I'm not sure, but non-responders two percent. That's in 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 writing, um, and you can. I have seen because I do a lot of teeter testing because I'm very pro rational vaccination as as you are. Yeah. If the car is it it has it, the 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 car has a lot of uh fuel in the tank you don't need to top it up in fact if you give a vaccine to a a, a dog who's got great antibody teeters to say parvo that vaccine has zero effect on the antibodies yeah hal thompson at glasgow university was saying this 30 years ago if you've got good teeters there is no point in giving the vaccine because vaccines, all vaccines have a downside. They have, there are, it is possible to, to misinterpret the information which is given within the vaccine and produce autoimmune disease, produce IBDs, produce atopic dermatitis, to produce meningitis and, and, and you name it, you name a tissue it can become inflamed because of misinterpreted information from the vaccine. Okay. It doesn't happen very commonly that we can measure. Um, and I was going to say, we, that's a good question, but you know, I will say that uh -huh. in the last, probably the last 10 years, yeah. I have had more reports mm -hmm. of meningitis and encephalitis, <laughs> which is just, inflammatory mm -hmm. so not infectious mm -hmm. and i mean so many dogs that are really being sentenced to a life i haven't seen it much in cats but sentenced to a life of immunosuppressants mm -hmm. and the with the unknown cause mm -hmm. well why and why are we seeing this in very young dogs who have just gone through a whole series of vaccinations, vaccinations. and then maybe they got that 15 month uh, booster. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are seeing more and more mm -hmm. and more of this. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, they go through all the testing. They do their MRIs mm-hmm. and they do their scans and they do their spinal taps. Mm-hmm. And it just comes back as an inflammatory uh, meningoencephalitis, which I, I think is very sad. Yeah. Um, and I, I, it, the interesting thing is when you talk to neurologists, they will not say that this has anything to do with vaccines. It's, it's very interesting. I think our profession is, is um, slightly blind to <laughs> vaccine. I'm trying to be I'm trying to be uh, nice. professional <laughs> and scientific about this, okay? But unless the dog drops off the needle, yeah, you know what I mean? Then there is usually not an association made. Yeah, if the dog gets a vaccine in the morning and then, yep. then there's an inflammatory change that the dog has never seen in its entire life in the afternoon, they might give you that. If it happens the next day, it, 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 there's an exponential decline in recognition yeah. of the yes. association. And if it happens three weeks or three months after the vaccine. And yet it, these it, vaccines are designed <laughs> to last for at least a year, years. if not years and years and years. <laughs> so there's another interesting phenomenon with, within for Parvo, for example, what, because of the live attenuation is, yeah, if, if the WSAVA say, if you give a, a, a puppy a vaccine, at maybe 14 or 16 weeks when maternal immunity is definitely going to be down. And so there's a greater chance of getting good impact with the vaccine. It's not very well known, but it is in the World Small Animal Veterinary Association notes and says that puppy may not need revaccination for its entire life because the immunity which is measured with the antibodies you can do it every year if you like can persist at really great levels for years and years and years and years and years which is phenomenal yep. okay i know and, and yet we still and yet we vaccinate every three years that are getting vaccinated every year and i mean yeah. it just it makes me crazy which is i mean that's why we do what we do yeah. because we are trying to get that education across so sure. let's uh switch tracks a little bit uh-huh. let's talk about the respiratory thing okay because uh, I, I i did a consultation with somebody yesterday and she said um that her she had just taken her dogs in and the veterinarian recommended that she vaccinate but and she's she's a pretty holistic person but she fell for this uh that they get both dogs vaccinated for influenza which her dogs have never been vaccinated for that because of the mystery respiratory illness going around now first of all it's still a mystery as to what this might be because all the labs that have been testing have been testing for the known respiratory problems mm-hmm. that we see routine, fairly routinely. Mm-hmm. The two kinds of influenza, the Bordetella, parainfluenza. So they're testing for all of those things because we know that they exist. Mm-hmm. And yet not one of these labs has said, oh, this looks like an outbreak of influenza or this looks like an outbreak mm-hmm. of Bordetella. So why would we recommend vaccinating for something that uh, you know, that we know it is not? And when I asked her that, she said, well, I asked my vet about that. And what he said was, well, it would be really awful for your dogs to be exposed to this new whatever it is and also have influenza at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that's like being, hup- <laughs> being hit by a bus and a train at the same time. You know, it's not very yeah. likely, you know. <laughs> and these are dogs that don't go to boarding, grooming, daycare, like <clears throat> nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, <laughs> I think it's a little bit like the early days of the pandemic where we didn't really know. However, with the pandemic, we found out really very rapidly what the genomic sequence was there. And what's extraordinary is with this, with this disease, yeah, because we don't know whether it's viral or bacterial or both. We're still clue- we're clueless and we're down. The- or, yeah, I mean, it could be any of those things. We we just do not know what it could be. The kennel cough, this is, I, I, I lecture on kennel cough a lot. And kennel cough 
we can vaccinate for for Bordetella bronchiseptica because it makes you your bronchiseptic, yeah, which is a bacterium, very interesting bacterium. We can talk about that in a second if you fancy. So it can be caused by Bordetella, para influenza, adenovirus, canine distemper, canine influenza, which I guess you can we we tend not to vaccinate for influenza we patch we we used to cover for para influenza but we don't really nowadays you can get it from canine herpes virus you can get it from mycoplasma which is neither a virus nor a bacterium very interesting on raw pet medics next week in fact actually we're going to be talking about myco uh, mycoplasma uh, bacteria oh, and mycoplasma tube tuberculosis and and all these interesting things the one that causes kennel cough is myco mycoplasma canis okay and then finally canine rheovirus okay so you can cover for two of these things so it's like being able to dodge red bullets but being fired at by a whole rainbow of bullets okay <laughs> if you like it's like what's, what's the point in in learning how to dodge the red ones when you're going to get hit by the green or the orange or the blue <laughs> if you like i just made that up on the spot but it's kind of, that's kind of what it, what it what it's like really because there's a risk involved dr judy with every vaccination of all the vaccines i have to say though bordetella is for me the probably the least worst vaccine because the vaccine <laughs> actually goes yeah this is the up the nose one that dogs usually hate this is the up the nose one it, it Do you guys don't have the oral one um, I always used to put, give it orally because of the, the nasopharynx. Uh, because, yeah, because uh, they came out with the oral over here. Oh. but And they still have the injectable, which is just dumb. Uh, well, but there's yeah. that whole thing about if you, you know, uh, uh, f for respiratory viruses like measles, mumps and rubella, we give a jab in your arm. OK, now that's crazy when these are the new mucous membranes, see, uh, your, your <laughs> eyes and your nose and your mouth. They're going to be taking the, the, the bulk. It's IgA and IgM. They're going to be doing most of the heavy lifting. And yet we put it in here so that we get, you know, different IgG responses, IgE responses, which explains a certain amount of autoimmune problem. Yeah, because you're giving the, you're giving the right information in the wrong place to a certain extent with, right. with, with some of these things, because the body deals with things differently when it goes in through the mucous membranes, which is where it's supposed to for a respiratory virus or through the, in the, in the arm. Um, I found out. So yeah. in, in your mm, experience, yeah. how, when we give that oral or intranasal yeah. vaccine, how long are our pets? Cause there is a, 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 a cat kennel yeah. cough or to tell a vaccine as well. How long are they shedding? Yeah after being given that fabulous one. this is really interesting okay so as they walk out of the consulting room they'll probably have a drip coming out of their nose that is not or shedding sneezing. or they're going to be yeah <laughs> which is an explosive uh an explosive drip coming from the nose so they're going to have that yeah pretty much every single one every single dog will 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 have it because just gravity will will, will do that but what we absolutely know, and the Americans have been leading this for years and years and years, is that that dog will be shedding live uh, virus for up to six weeks. OK, and I believe in the States, you're not allowed to get take your dog to the uh, to the kennels if it's within a six week period after the intranasal Bordetella bronchoseptica vaccination. I don't think. I don't think that that is an across the board okay. thing. Um, and I will tell you that the local kennels that were near my clinics, uh -huh. they basically, for many, many years, it, I, we would get the phone call. I have to drop my dog off at the kennel today. They said he has to have all these vaccines. <laughs> and so people want to run right over on their way to the yeah. kennel, which was a mile down yeah. the road, and get all the vaccines, which, by the way, is doing nothing other than shedding things all over the kennel for everybody yeah. else. So your dog is now vaccinating everyone yeah. else. So you know, when we pointed out that that was really just pretty useless, mm -hmm. Then they made a two-week rule that they had to have their vaccinations two weeks ahead of time. Okay. But based on 
this information, they're literally still shedding for six weeks. So I know that there are still boarding, grooming, daycare facilities that will allow dogs in who got their vaccines in the car on the way there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, for those who are being a little more stringent, a lot of them, it's a two week window. I have never seen a six-week window. seen a six-week window. I think okay. that's amazing. I, I, was, I was under the impression that, that there are uh, establishments in the States who do six weeks because it's, that would it's be great. shedding for six weeks. <laughs> it's a pain, but that's really, really rigorous uh, disease management um, because yeah. uh, in the UK, I, I don't know of any kennel who has any stipulation in this regard whatsoever so you guys even with two weeks at least that's going in the right direction yeah Um, so mm. is the influenza Mm -hmm. vaccine are they shedding that as well which is given uh sub q so not up the nose uh no but with well parvo yeah you give you give parvo virus um uh you give that sub q in the scruff and within days it's coming out the back end okay it's in, in stool Okay, so we do know that um, with the influenza, I don't see why it shouldn't, but I can't put my hand on my heart because <laughs> I've done lots yeah. of notes yeah, on I, the mystery I've, I've never, virus. Yeah, I've never done, um, I've never done research, mm. uh, and I don't know if anyone else has oh. done research because, frankly, they don't care. But, um, but I think that it's a it's a really interesting question. Yeah. So. Um, for instance, if uh, we do a ton of rescue work, and so I work with a lot mm. of rescues and a lot of shelters, and if a if a dog or cat comes into a shelter or a rescue situation, the first thing that happens is they get a whole bunch of jabs, and so and then they're put in this population. You know, maybe maybe they're kept in isolation mm. if if kennel or foster has an isolation area where they can keep the the dog or cat separate but that requires a lot if you bring in 10 new dogs a day and so you throw all 10 of them in 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 isolation together they're no longer (laughs) in isolation they're exposing each other to everything that they have and i get it and i'm not it i i'm not a shelter medicine veterinarian i think it it is a very difficult Mm. situation to to be dealing with shelter medicine is a a whole different Mm -hmm. ball game um but it's upsetting to me when i if i adopt a dog that has gone through a shelter situation and it's like oh look he just got 16 vaccines today and uh usually a flea and tick oral that i don't like and uh a heartworm shot that i don't like and neutered into the bargain (laughs) within a day or two of all that yeah. yeah. So uh, it's it's a difficult situation. Yeah. Um, so what else do you have for us on this unknown respiratory? Okay. Well, I've thing. so so I think the key thing is that uh, people people are asking the question. Well, Doc, are you worried? Are you scared of what's going to happen? And I would say that I'm slightly worried, but I'm just going to watch the situation because you know the last three years have told us a lot about how to do things right and how to do things wrong without putting too fine a point on it. And, and I don't want to approach this disease, even though it's not in my country, I don't want to approach it intellectually from the wrong standpoint. So I'm, I'm, I'm slightly worried, but I am not scared would be, would be the thing. The next really important thing is, should I take my dog to the vet? Okay. And for me, that's a really easy, it's a black and white thing. If the dog is coughing and we can talk about the symptoms, but let's say if your dog is coughing and they're bright, then you may not need to take them to the vet. If your dog is coughing and they are dull, you really need to get to that vet um, uh, pretty soon, especially if they're brachy- brachycephalic because any type of inflammation In this area, with these breeds who have some problem breathing even on the best of days, then (laughs) they, you know, they've got a head start um, on the way to uh, uh, pneumonias and having really, we call it, uh, uh, um, uh, it's a, it's a, um, how would you call it? I was going to say dysphagia, but that's not able to eat. 
dis dyspnea. dyspnea yeah so like paneer like pneumonia <laughs> dyspnea yeah so there, there you go so i've divided i've divided the disease into four stages healthy early moderate and late okay so healthy is they may have a virus but they you can't tell they are absolutely symptom free okay that totally ha happens okay then there's early you've got a bit of runny eyes they've got a bit of runny nose they've got a bit of cough but they're great and they're fantastic they're, they're totally okay then you've got moderate which is the third stage which would be not quite right but not terrible i might take them to the vet i may not take them to the vet and then you've got the fourth stage which is dog is 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 is, is dull and uh dyspneic and um they may be off their food they may have they may be uh, spiking a temperature and they are veterinarian material and my, my strong advice is get to know your vet before you need your vet okay so just give them a ring yeah. and just say okay i've heard about the respiratory virus i haven't got a veterinarian at the moment please kind of come and say hello or have a chat with one of the vets or one of the nurses and if they're if if if, if they are able to uh to put you and your dogs on their books then that is a strong start and i would say that's a good idea yeah now, one thing i mm. i would say on that is see what their response is like if you have a sick dog if you have a veterinarian and you mm. have a sick dog who's coughing and sneezing and lethargic and off their food and you say i need an appointment for my dog to be seen because he's got these symptoms you want to see what their response is to that because hopefully the veterinarian or the practice <clears throat> has protocol in place for dealing with your dog and not having your dog sitting in the waiting room with five other dogs because that is a red flag that, hey, they don't care if my dog is infecting other dogs, which means they also don't care if other dogs are infecting my dog. So I would say five or six years ago, the, uh, I don't remember if it was the first influenza that came through or the second influenza that came through, but it was a big deal. There were a couple of uh, critical care hospitals in our area that had to shut down their entire ICU wards because they had a dog with influenza and then a bunch of dogs got, and then everybody kept getting sick. And so they had to shut down and not use the facility for two weeks while they were cleaning and disinfecting and making sure that they had gotten rid of everything. So during that time period, of course, every other vet clinic in the area were kind of like, Oh geez, you know, we don't want something mm -hmm. like that to happen to us. So we instituted an entire protocol we had it uh, completely different. So like everybody, if you were going to deal with one of these animals, we would tell the client to wait outside, park on the far side of the parking lot. We would actually put on our Tyvek suits, mm. which, you know, that, that's the, the mm. white suits with the masks and the goggles and the booties and the gloves and the yeah. whole nine yards. And we kept those in a separate area and they were a one-time use kept those in a separate area and we had a little tray that had separate thermometers, separate stethoscopes. Everything was mm. kept separate for a potentially infectious case. And we would carry that, we would dress all up and carry that outside and see the client and the patient outside so that we were not risking contaminating every anyone else. And once we evaluated the patient, then we could decide, oh, geez, now do we need to bring them in for x-ray? Do we need to do something else? Um, and we treated those animals as outpatient and taught the clients how to do everything mm -hmm. at home because we didn't have an isolation ward in our particular mm -hmm. hospital where we would be able to keep an infectious case. So it's really important that you ask questions like, well, do you, do you have a protocol for a dog that might have this infectious respiratory mm -hmm. thing? Like if I'm bringing my dog into you for a dental procedure or a routine visit or whatever, um, you know, you might want to ask them, how are you handling a potentially infectious respiratory case? Uh, I just want to make sure that my pet doesn't get exposed. I'm bringing them in for a wellness visit. I want to make sure they don't get exposed to something mm -hmm. awful while mm -hmm. they're there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally, totally right. Um, with the, uh the 
uh, specialist centers you're just saying about specialist centers they are there are some reports of up to five percent uh fatalities with the canine infectious respiratory disease okay this is the mystery disease that we've got however it's mainly in in oregon and uh 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 and uh, over on the West yeah, Coast, a, but now up to yeah, 37, we've seen a few pockets. Yeah, 37 states are, is, yeah. is demonstrating. Yeah, it. it really started in, in mm. Oregon. And that was uh, the the social media post that I mm. initially mm. saw about this was out in Oregon with a large group mm. of dogs. Um, and we have seen it in pockets kind of here, there and everywhere, but it really has been a few localized cases. And, I, you know, personally, th- what I would say is uh, maybe this isn't the best time to be taking your dogs on uh, fundraising walks with a bunch of shelter totally, dogs. Totally. Um, <laughs> you know, that's the sort of thing I yeah. would avoid. Uh, I would not be running out to get every respiratory vaccine that's available because we know that they're not going to have anything to do with this. Um, and mm. I would not be putting my dogs in a situation with dogs of unknown history and illness. Because as you said, we can have carriers that are absolutely mm-hmm. asymptomatic. Yep. Prevention's better than better than cure, folks. And uh, I think that's really important. But there, there, there's an awful lot of things that you can do. Um, even at home, uh, even if your dog is absolutely healthy and you just want to kind of uh, stack the cards in your favor, I think... It is a, it's a great excuse to uh, start afresh. So for me, I'm really, really anti-volatile uh, or organic compound type products. These are the Glade fresheners, the, the, the plug-ins, the ultra-perfumed laundry uh, products and things like this, yeah? Yeah. Um, your living room is not a uh, a forest glade, I'm afraid. So why does it need to smell like a forest glade? Yeah, keep it clean, you know. And and you know, uh, uh, it 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 just is going to smell like a room, and I'm okay with that because these volatile organic compounds they're they're really very uh, corrosive and very irritating to the dog. And you've got to remember that they've got their sense of smell is thousands of times greater to, to, to these kind of smells. So if it smells like delightful to you, it probably smells like acrid tar to the dog. Okay. (laughs) They kind of just put up with it, you know, but, but is it doing them any good? No. So I'd say let's, let's, let's just, you know, let's get the house as clean, properly clean as possible. Uh, don't smoke in the house. That's obviously a, a, a really stupid thing to, to to do for you and for the dog and for anybody else who's, who's in there. So, yeah, that's a really obvious one, but you never know. I think it's worth worth saying there. So these are these are things that you can you can do. Maybe stop walking the dog on the road next to where the cars are because if you think of it, their nose level is right where the exhaust level is. And so they're going to get True. Um, more extreme exposure to the particulates, especially in diesel, or to fumes from uh, from from petrol engines. So uh, I'd be trying to get into nature uh, a little more. It's not possible for everybody, but as if you're if you're aware of it, then that's half the battle. It means that maybe you go for a walk around the park rather than down the street. Those kind of things. Just I'm just. Those are good points, and those are things that I had not mm. brought up um, in my in my past mm. talks. Uh, you know, we talk about boosting mm. the immune system with things like bone broth and totally. colostrum and mushrooms totally. and all those kinds of things, but we also do not want to destroy the respiratory tract. So those are really good points. Avoiding scented sprays and candles unless they are specifically made to be pet safe. Um, Mm. because those volatile compounds, like you said, and I have a whole presentation on this, uh, you know, the differences in, you know, our 6 million olfactory receptors versus their 200 million that it's just Mm. huge. And, um, 
you know, I've got a couple of really good case studies of dogs that developed nasal tumors and died from cancer because they were exposed to smoke, mm -hmm. heavy perfumes, uh, you know, sprays, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, so really, really important points. And I appreciate mm -hmm. those. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we have been talking for about 45 minutes. So um, probably most people are now, you know, their heads are spinning. And I really appreciate all the information that you bring to these chats. You, you're you a wealth of information. I can't wait to meet you in Orlando and hear your talk. Um, I, I I just, I'm the MC, so I just get to be the fly on the wall and soak in information. Hey, you know what? I think we're going to have an absolute ball. We're going to have some really fantastic minds. We're all going to come together. We're going to do a lot of dancing. We're going to eat some great food. We're going to talk a lot about disease, about about uh, uh, ourselves, the world, our dogs, our pets. It's going to be fantastic. And I, I want to say a massive uh, kudos to you for organizing it. It's, 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 it's something that we've got something to look forward to through the whole of 24. It's, um, it's the 22nd of October. Is that right, Dr. Judy? It's the 12th, 12th and 13th, and 13th of October. Of October. Uh, and it's funny, my husband and I were talking mm. yesterday and he said, you know, this has been on your yeah. bucket list for about 10 years to bring these great minds together. And, you know, I had to get to that station in life where it's like, OK, we're willing we're willing to risk our our savings <laughs> to be able to bring all these people together. Um, I think it's going to be wildly successful. I'm really excited about it. We're, we're actually already thinking about what what's going to be the next thing on the plate oh, after wow. this one. Um, although the group of people that we're bringing together for this is so great that uh, I don't know if, if I'm going to be able well, to Well, I'll it. tell you what, for, 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 uh, RPM, I will disappear and let your good people um, crack on with their day. But when we started Raw Pet Medics, we thought we're going to have about six weeks of topics to talk about. You're probably the same because you're doing talk, talks all the time. We thought we'd do about six weeks, maybe stretch it to 10 weeks. Actually, we've now done uh, approaching 150 episodes. And with every single one, we think of another three things to talk about. It's just fabulous. And it's, that's what Orlando is going to be like. It's going to be no holds barred. Yep. Let's think. Let's yep. talk. Let's do this. And for um, for veterinary students and young veterinarians who are attending, we have a special meeting of the minds with our speakers and our young veterinarians together in one room. You may okay. not know about this yet, Nick, but you've been uh, okay. you are part of it. Uh, we have a special hour set aside for all the veterinarians to come together because one of my goals this year is to bring along those veterinary students and those young veterinarians who have an interest in holistic medicine but aren't quite sure where to start or where to go or they just want to learn more and this is their chance to be able to speak with the brilliant minds of the world so i'm really excited and about i think that we, we well. should have a prize for the uh for the most tricky general question yeah you can get specific about stuff and you'll lose everybody but the most tricky general question i'll give a prize okay bottle of champagne to the person who gives us the best general question there you go there you go well there'll be tons of time for questions and answers throughout the weekend too so all right i'm excited nick thank you as usual you are amazing we appreciate everything that you're doing, and this is a collaborative effort around the world to educate pet owners, and we are so thankful that you are part uh, of it. Such a pleasure, Judy. More power to you. Take care. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you.